So uh, this is a landing page for curriculum management. Um, since I've logged in as a faculty member, um, it, it limits the options that I have. So I can create a course. I can look for courses. I can browse programs. Um, I haven't viewed anything recently, so there's nothing there. But here are some management tools that will only kind of hit sideways today um, in terms of course set management and learning objectives management, but we will look um, a little closer detail at dependency analysis. So a little, a little narrative that I made up is, you know, Fred's a, a faculty member, um, and, and he's noticed that a lot of his calculus students, um, there's no prereq for calculus one, and he feels like they really should have a prereq that students come in with, with pre-calculus. Um, so he wants to propose a modification to the calculus course for life sciences that requires pre-calculus. He also wants to add an additional format to the course. He, it's currently offered just as a lecture, and he would like to offer it as a lecture lab as well. So let's take a look at what Math 130 currently looks like. So this is the course I would like to modify. It's Calculus 1 for the Life Sciences. This is sort of the at-a-glance information about the course. It just gives the most pertinent information. Um, in Curriculum Management, there's three views. There's the at-a-glance. There's the detail view, which gives all the nitty-gritty about the course that um, not everybody's going to be interested, but it includes governance, the current logistics of the course, learning objectives if there are any, course requisites, et cetera. Um, the at a glance summarizes more of the pertinent information for more of the casual browser. And then there's a the catalog view, which um, indicates how the, sh the course will actually show up in the catalog. So he's satisfied that he's chosen the right course, so he's going to propose a course modification. And this then brings him to the proposal. It, you always land on the review pr proposal tab, but I'll just point you to the tabs on the left. These are the various sections currently delivered in terms of um, course and course proposals. So there's basic course in information about the course, and this is where you have, you know, course IDs and titles, et cetera, um, attached to structures, instructors rather. So what he's going to do is he's going to go in and he's going to say the rationale for this proposal is um, to add a prereq. So this is where you um, add the rationale for what the change that's being proposed. It highlights how many characters you have left there. So then we're going to move on to the next section, which is um, governance. Uh, currently, the curriculum oversight organization of this course. That means who has review and approval rights for changes to the course is the mathematics department. We're going to leave that now because that's the correct department. Um, you also have the ability to add organizations that are allowed to administer the course. Um, they may not be one and the same. For instance, um, at the University of Washington, continuing ed, we typically have an academic partner that sort of sponsors the curriculum and then the continuing ed department is the one that actually offers it or administers the course. So those are two separate organizations. But there's nothing to change here. So I'm going to move on to course logistics, which is, not surprisingly, all the logistics of the course. It indicates what term the course is allowed to be offered in, um, the length of the course. This is all configurable. If you want to offer a course, it's an eight-hour course over one day or a, you know, a two-year course. You could. I don't know that you would do that or if you have the business need to do that, but you could with any college students. Um, there's different grade assessment scales that if, um, again, all these things are configurable and student registration options. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to add an additional format. Right now the course is being offered as a lecture, um, four contact hours per week. I'm going to add an additional format wherein it's both a lecture um, I'm going to trim it down to three hours per, per week. Um, and again, it's a semester for this particular course, and I expect to have upwards of 20. These anticipate, anticipated class sizes are really more for evaluating whether the pedagogy that's been proposed is appropriate. It doesn't have any restraint, constraints in terms of offering. 
I mean, if you're you're saying I want to do a discussion section with 500 students, it's probably not very feasible. So it's just to give committees um, whatever information they need to review and approve the course. So I've added a lecture, and now I'm also going to add a discussion section, and I'm going to have it to be two hours per week. Um, again, it's just a semester-long activity, and I might say, you know, 10 students, because I might have two discussion sections um, for the class. So what this says is that when I go to offer the course, I can offer it in two various ways. I can offer it as a lecture only, or I could offer it as a lecture lab combo. So that's the implications of doing that. Learning objectives, there are currently no learning objectives um, indicated for this course. Um, I cheated and created some ahead of time, so let me just copy paste them in. So for a pre-calculus course, a learning objective might be to analyze behavior of sequences and series. Um, what I can do within quality students is not only enter the learning objectives for a particular course, but I also can categorize those learning objectives according to um, whether they are you know, mathematical reasoning. And these are all categories that have been set up a priori, but they can be defined on the fly, some of the like. It can indicate whether they're learning objectives that are a result of accreditation requirements, whether it's a skill objective or subject objective. But I might say I think this um, is really part of academic um, say, mathematical reasoning. So I'm going to add that as a category of my learning objective. And the value of this is to say come accreditation time and accreditors ask, well, where are you teaching mathematical reasoning in your curriculum? This makes identifying those courses much easier. All right. So I'm going to save and move on to adding a prerequisite. So this is the screen where we would add prerequisites to the course. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a prerequisite of pre-calculus to this calculus course. So what I want to say, there's a number of different rule types. Um, I won't go through each one, but it's, these are all configurable by each institution. But these, I don't know, I think we have about 15 to 20 here. These represent the most commonly used type of rules. Um, must have completed an individual course must have completed all courses from a particular course set, must have completed maybe two of these following courses. That's what these rule types represent. But I'm just going to do an individual course. I'm going to say that students must have completed Math 115. And I'm going to add that rule. And then that the prerequisite shows as a natural language, this is a natural language translation of that rule that could be directly published in the catalog, for instance. So what's actually codified in the system is what is actually published in the catalog, which is nice. Um, the other types of um, eligibilities, um, you can add prerequisites. You can add recommended preparation, which isn't actually enforced. Obviously, it's just recommended. Anti-requisites, courses that say if you've taken this course, you can't take this course. And then um, uh, credit constraints, so courses that restrict constraints. This is a calculus course, if you recall. So basically, the rule is if you've taken Math 140, which is also a calculus course, if you've taken Math 220, which is also a calculus course, you can't get credit for, for this course. Uh, finally, the other sections, we have course fees. I'm not going to cover this, but if, you, if there were any fees associated with the course or if you wanted to allocate expenditures and revenues from this course to particular organizations, you could do that here. This is typically of great interest to, to um, people who work with self-supported programs, um, continuing ed, that kind of thing. Authors and collaborators, um, I will show this in the review and approval process. We'll just skim over it now. But this is a place to add additional people to help with the proposal. And then finally, we have a place to attach supporting documents. So if there was any kind of analysis done, 
that showed why the prerequisite needed to be added, um, why the learning objectives were required, why they needed the additional format, then they could upload it here. So finally, before I go to workflow, oh, I did skip over active date, which I think I need, but anyway, we'll come back to that. So finally, um, I come to the, re to the review proposal section, and this is where I come when I, when I think I'm ready to sit submit my proposal, it allows me to review it at a glance. So what, what this section does is it highlights differences between the original course and the proposed modification. So obviously the original course is the proposal title, so that's highlighted. But we come down here and we see that you know, there, there was a proposal rationale added. We see that there was an entire new activity format added, so that's highlighted. We see that there was a new learning objective added, a new um, course requisite added. So any changes between the original course and the, and the mod modified course will show. The other nice thing is we can, it says the proposal has missing fields. Show me what's missing. It'll highlight in red or sort of a wimpy pink, I think, here, our required fields that I forgot to fill out that will be required before I move to workflow. So what I have to do is I actually have to say, well, when do I want these modifications to take effect? I'm going to go to edit. If I just click edit, it will throw me right to that section. I'm going to say, well, I want these changes to start fall semester of 2000, let's say 2013. So now when I go back to review proposal, I don't have the error message any longer that I'm missing fields, and now I see that I can either submit the proposal or I can cancel it or copy it to a new course proposal. So Fred faculty feels comfortable with what he proposed, so now he's going to submit the proposal to workflow. And you get the, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> submit. And now we see both from the message here that it's been rounded to workflow and from the proposal status here that the proposal is currently in workflow. So what I want to show you next is how we can track where a proposal is. I know these screens are a little bit ugly. Um, this, these are directly the right screen. So we're, again, we're using um, uh, Q, Quality Enterprise Workflow as our workflow engine. So these are Q screens, or rise screens that we're calling when we say, here's the, we made a modification of Calculus 1 for the Life Sciences. It's in route. It was initiated by Fred Fred. Let me take a look at the route log to help me understand where it's going next. And this is where we, it's defaulting to the, um, to the reference workflow. So it's in the action list to be approved by um, developer one, but we also can see, it also can anticipate where it's going next. So using the organization service, whereas where you define your hierarchy and then you attach people to that hierarchy, Q is actually directly reading that org service. It's identifying the people who need to see this um, proposal and is planning to route the proposal directly to them. Okay, so the next stop I'm going to log out. The next stop in the workflow is, and again, I apologize for the less than useful names of our uh, test data. But so Dev1, who was next on the workflow, comes in and sees that in their inbox there's um, a credit course modification, calculus one for the life sciences, and they're being asked to approve it. So. Clicking on that will take them directly again to the review proposal summary. They can see the changes between, uh, quickly at a glance, they can see what, being, what changes are being proposed and why. So the curriculum manager here quickly notes that, okay, they're adding a new activity or a new format, but they're also adding a new prerequisite of Math 115, and that makes them a little bit nervous. Adding a prerequisite to a class and what that might do for the curriculum makes them a little bit nervous. So Dev1 is going to, um, or the curriculum manager, <laughs> I should say, is going to use a tool called dependency analysis. He's going to go over there and say, well, let me see the course Math 130, which is the modification that's being proposed to, 
what are all the places in the curriculum that consume Math 130? So Math 130 is the course that we're modif that's a modification is being proposed for. And the curriculum manager wants to understand what is the potential impact of modifying that course? Where are all the places in the, in the university curriculum that might consume or touch this course? So basically, here's what you've got. So what we can see is at a glance that Math 130 is a prerequisite for these three courses. So these are all biological science courses. Um, one could go and do those courses if one wanted. But there's the rule. So basically, Math 130 is one of two courses that must be taken prior to taking principles of ecology. So we have the rule there. Math 130 is one of two courses that must be taken before taking membrane biophysics. So the implication there is if you add a prerequisite to Math 130, you've suddenly created a bigger prerequisite chain than, than you might have anticipated. Um, math 130 is also a co-requisite for the following course. So we see that Math 130 is a co-requisite for programming for geographers, um, or it's also one of actually three that students could take. But again, if they if they have to take this course along with um, Geography 476 and you've added an additional prereq to Math 130, you may want to know that and understand those dependencies. So those are course dependencies. Those are courses that consume Math 130. And then you can also ask the question from a program perspective, what programs consume this course? So we see that Math 130 is an entrance requirement for biological sciences program. Um, and then it's a completion requirement for these other programs. So if it's a completion requirement for biological sciences and kinesiology, and you've added a prerequisite, you've essentially added an additional completion requirement to these programs, and you may want to know that. Any questions about that? No. Nope, I guess not. <laughs> OK. I think everybody's so, in awe. Pardon? I think everybody's just in awe here. OK. So Dev one's a little nervous after looking at um, after looking at all the courses and programs that consume the course that's being modified, they're a little nervous about approving the, the modification. So basically, when that when when they log in to or, or access the, the the proposed modification, here are the different actions that they could take. Because we're at that first node where they can decide whether to blanket approve or to send it through the whole review process. So they can either approve it, reject it, return it to a previous node, um, and generally like, yeah, there's something wrong with them. I'm not really happy with, with the modifications you propose, change it. They could go ahead and blanket approve it, saying, yeah, this looks fine. Um, and they could also copy to new proposals. So those are the workflow actions that are allowed. In this particular case, DevOne's a little bit nervous because of all the dependencies on this course. So what she's going to do is she's going to add someone on an ad hoc basis. She's going to add her friend Doug, who's over in the geography department, let's say, and say, please take a look and comment on this proposal. And I just want you to know that this is in place. So. When they add, so basically what this highlights is that even if there aren't people that are on the um, codified workflow, anybody can, or approvers rather, can add collaborators at any point on an ad hoc basis to the workflow. So if there's financial implications, if there's human subjects implications, if there's any kind of implications and someone else needs to be brought into the review and approval process, who's not part of the standard, they could be brought in. So Dev1 is not going to approve until they hear back from Doug. So when Doug logs in, he's going to see, oh, in my inbox, I've got a request. I'm just being FYI'd on this proposal. So they could go in. So Doug goes in, theoretically, just takes a look at the changes. And then he only has commenting privileges. So you see all the tabs on the left are gone now. 
because there's no editing, there's only commenting. So he might say, looks fine, looks fine, I'd approve. Submits the comments, those comments are logged. Um, and now when Dev1 goes back in, she can access the comments and see that Doug responded and said, looks fine, I'd approve. So as a result, she happily, I think it approves the proposal. Here's every time approval or a rejection happens, any time a decision is made on a proposal, um, there's a, a place where to enter comments so that there's a, a log of why decisions were made. Right now I'm just going to type junk in. And then there's the ability to end the current version. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go back into curriculum management, and we're going to see that there are now two versions of the course. There was the one that we just did that was superseded. Um, and the second version is currently active. If we want to, we can um, compare those versions to see what, what were the major changes between the two versions. So again, once the course has been approved, this way anybody accessing the um, course catalog can identify what are the differences between the old version and the new version of the course. So that concludes mostly the course and course approval process section. This is a really, really light catalog. Um, it was more for um, more for the per you know more for visibility purposes. That once you add courses and you have courses that you can search and select. We expect that most institutions, if they're using curriculum management will actually use it as a feed to whatever catalog system that they have and set up. And it's more of a data extraction and display. But this is just in case they didn't have something like that and they actually wanted to see what was in the catalog, but they could. But this is actually, it's a very sort of, it's a very basic, very light catalog view of courses. So you would not be bound to using this particular view. There's a um, there's both an export and a print option. So um, in this case, it's just printing. So you could print the page and and whatever's in the proposal, which is nothing right now in this particular one that I just selected. But yes, so there's a printing option. Okay, so if we're back to curriculum management. We could um, browse academic programs, and here I've got biological sciences. Um, there's, we have faceted search, and there's not very many programs in our, um, in our test database, so the faceted search is not all that impressive. But if one wanted just to consider you know, undergraduate programs, if one wanted to consider just certain degree types, um, there's a way to you know, facet the search accordingly. So but I'm going to take a look at uh, the Bachelor's of Science in Biological Sciences. And it's going to have some real similarities with what we saw in core. So there's different sections. You've got the section, which is your key program information. So, and all the, you know, all the stuff is configurable in terms of what your identifying details for the program are, what level, how you classify your programs, um, program titles, dates of programs in terms of what time or what time, what term the the program started. Um, we recognize with programs there's a lot more in terms of, of active dates that one might require. You might say, well, what's the, what's the last term that we're going to admit students to the program? Um, what's the last term we're going to allow students um, to actually enter the program? What's 
the last term will actually allow students to enroll in the program. So it gets a little bit more nuanced there. Um, here's some of the accreditation information and zip, zip codes. There's, again, with programs, the, the organizational structure is often much more complicated than at the course level. Um, you could have a curriculum oversight college and then a particular unit. You could have um, a, a organization that oversees the student. And I'm just going to show you some of the additional um, organizations. You could have who deploys the program. Um, who's responsible for financing a program, who has financial control of the program. So there's actually a number of different organizations that you can enter in terms of um, who governs the program. Here shows what specializations are associated with the program, um, the catalog and descriptive information. Again, whatever you enter here is what will show up in the catalog. Um, Program requirements, this is where all the activities are really happening. So again, here's our entrance requirements. For this particular program, the only entrance requirements that have been identified are for transfer students. So basically, here, you know, transfer students to get into the program, they must meet these roles, you know, and I'm not going to read them to you, but hopefully, given the fact they're a natural language, um, representation, they're, they're pretty straightforward. There's our friend, Math 130, that we saw we had a dependency on um, when we modified that course. But we're saying it's an entrance requirement for transfer students. So they must have either taken this, um, this and this, or the 130 and 131, or they must have taken 140 and 141. And they must have taken, gotten a minimum grade of C in these courses. Anytime you want to actually see what the courses are that are being referenced within the program, they're hyperlinked. So, oh, okay, now I see what Chemistry 1 is. Um, I can see what the prerequisites for that particular course are, if any, et cetera. So you can access that information from when, within here. Um, Again, if you remember, we had sort of clumped it into what, what do students need to get into the program, what do students need to do to stay in the program. Here it is a very basic satisfactory progress requirement, which is students in this program must maintain a 2.0. <laughs> um, you can get as fancy as you want in terms of, of, of the requirements here, and very specific to individual programs in terms of satisfactory progress requirements. And then um, here are the... Uh, completion requirements here. So what courses a student must have to take and okay. So that's sort of the basic structure of programs. Um, again, there's learning objectives at the program level, supporting documents can be attached. Um, Programs get modified much less frequently than courses. So the approval process, there is a workflow and approval process for programs. Um, I would have to, let me log in as admin to show that. But it's somewhat similar. Um, there, there's more restrictions in terms of who can modify a program. So for instance, here's a, someone has proposed to modify a major And um, there is basically the takeaway here is there is a proposal process for modifying programs, but we recognize that it happens a little bit differently than a lot of course approval. So I'm going to pause there. Um, I just wanted to give you a flavor of what um, programs look like. Um, they, they do leverage rules very heavily um, in terms of defining requirements. Um, so I think the last couple of things I want to cover, and then I'll open up to questions because I realize we're at time, is, is to understand uh, who is using curriculum management. Um, we have five institutions that are currently either implementing or in progress of implementing. Um, Boston College are doing a proof of concept. Northwest and South Africa is implementing. Berkeley has implemented. Um, University of Maryland is currently implementing. Here at University of Washington, we're doing um, primarily a data migration through the services. That is, we're not doing a full build out of the UI, but we are using the, the curriculum management services. 
And then here's just a slide that represents where you can get more information. And it's sort of ordered in terms of level engagement or commitment. If you have basic questions, of course, you can always address them to me or to the, the, the listeners above. There's documentation, a lot of documentation on curriculum management um, on our public facing wiki page. The code base you can download and play around with. Um, the beauty of uh, open source software is you can go get the code and actually look at it. Um, obviously, if you were getting to the phase of, of implementing and wanted to track defects, which I think is pretty far down the road for you guys, but that's how you would do it. And um, any enhancements that you might want could be circled back into the project.